This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. He helps us pan for the gold inside ourselves. You need to have grit. I mean, a lot of this is grit. I feel like I've been made a better lawyer. They're talking about something that's real to them. You have to be really careful not to be Goliath. They saved a bunch of lives and changed society forever. But let's just begin the conversation. Welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation, your source for guidance to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your practice. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. Our guest today is Chad Roberts. Chad has been practicing law for over 25 years, but he started a firm called eDiscovery Co-Counsel. eDiscovery Co-Counsel helps other lawyers with discovery, evidence management, and electronically stored information protocols. Uh, Unfortunately, you know, you don't get everything on paper anymore, and companies don't keep everything on paper anymore. And if we don't learn to get what the companies actually have, we don't get the documents that show the real wrongdoing, the emails, the text messages, the electronic documents that sometimes we don't get if we don't know how to ask for them. Or if we ask for them to avoid giving them to us, they find a way to dump truck, you know, millions and millions of documents or try to make us pay tons of money for their searches. Chad's going to talk to us about how you avoid all that and get what you need. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Today on Trial Lawyer Nation, we have attorney Chad Roberts. Uh, He's with a firm in Miami, Florida called eDiscovery Co-Counsel, PLLC, and uh, he helps. He is a lawyer, but he also helps other lawyers with e-discovery. Uh, frankly, I, I was in a meeting with Chad here at the AAJ conference in Maui, uh, realized that I have a lot to learn on this subject. So selfishly, uh, I wanted to interview him so I could learn, and I hope you find something useful too. So Chad, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, man. It's so uh, nice to be here. Um, usually, I'm, I'm embarrassed to, to blather on so much about my own practice area. So when someone um, sits down and wants to talk about it, it's exciting and flattering at the same time. So I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to be here. This is a great service, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to more of these podcasts. So what is eDiscovery? So basically, the smart aleck answer is, um, in this day and age, everything's e-discovery. Really, there's very little. There's pa- certainly there's paper left. There's legacy paper. There's non-documentary evidence, obviously. Uh, the instrumentation of an aviation accident or a black box in a motor highway uh, accident. Certainly well, no, a black box is electronic data stored in a black box, actually. Right, right. So primarily people think in a case of documentary evidence that's stored in a digital format, that that the rules have kind of a bias towards that framework, but um, that typically tends to be the biggest challenge. Really, conceptually, the biggest challenge is volume. And in this day and age, all of the tools, all of the productivity tools that lawyers are familiar with uh, have so proliferated and eased the ability to create content. The content is, is so voluminous now that that's really the challenge. It's, it's not so much that it's the format, that it's in an electronic format. It's mostly the volume of it that really kills us. Um, well, I think the other thing is, you know, those of us who are not experts in electronic discovery when we're sending requests to a sophisticated corporation that probably has done, you know, business and intellectual property litigation where they have this stuff down, we don't know how to ask for things in a way that will actually get us what we want. Right. So, <laughs> we don't even know what's there to ask for, then how to how to get it where they, the request will be interpreted in a way to get us the responsive documents instead of sure. dumping us millions of pages what we don't want and keeping what we do. Sure. So here's the, the fundamental weakness that we have. When I say we, if I'm talking about people who represent consumers, when your client has vital signs and a pulse as opposed to being a corporation, 
you are inherently at a disadvantage with corporate America for the following primary reason. They have in their toolkit of experience the knowledge of how your discovery request translates in to a search on the other side for responsive information, how they collect it, how then they process it, how then they have a workflow to analyze whether it's responsive or not, and then the format that they give it to you in a way that's useful to you. So the real uh, you know, tectonic shift in, ad in advantage and disadvantage really in my mind occurred in December 2015 with the new Rule 26 and the proportionality uh, issues that came into Rule 26. And, and can you explain that? Because not everybody is on top of, I mean, a lot of sure. us, a lot of my listeners don't even practice in federal court that much, although I think the federal discovery rules kind of filter down to the state courts and how they analyze this stuff. And They do. So and tell us about what, what is this proportionality and how does it affect our ability to get discovery? Sure. So whether your judge in state court says they're doing it or not, what they are really doing is, do, is weighing a balancing test of um, is, is your request to produce uh, proportional to your case and at least in the new federal rule there are six proportionality factors um, there was a great debate about which one should be first because people knew that it would be psychologically more uh, compelling if it was first so they didn't allow cost to be first but the first one are you know is, is the issues in the case the cost um, and, and basically what trails then are a list of, of factors for a court to consider in determining whether or not the scope of your discovery is balanced to the reasonableness of the case. And so the big picture policy argument was if our civil justice system is going to work, it's got to be fair to defend dance and, and we don't want to allow claimants or reducing or requesting parties we don't want to allow requesting parties to make discovery um, itself a tactical tool of abuse so this was attempt uh, this was an attempt to to provide a uh, some rails on either side of the scope of discovery that basically said it's got to be proportional to the needs of the case the cost of the discovery is one factor, and, and the potential damages recovered in your case is another. Um, more than just a utilitarian approach of how much money is involved, it does factor in, like for example, an important social issue that may be in the case, or a new issue of law, or a public policy issue that may outweigh just the monetary issues. But generally, it's a bucket list of considerations to consider of whether your request is reasonable or not and how much information you're going to get. And whether you're in federal court or not, most judges are viscerally, intuitively doing this anyway. And I think they were before. And I think Don Slavic was actually on the committee uh, uh -huh. that helped come up with this role. He didn't right. necessarily support all of it, right. but uh, he was a really good plaintiff's lawyer. Right. Uh, so was said that, Elizabeth Cabrazer yeah, from, that, from our community That it's not well. really a market change and I think that's right you know anytime we've always had unduly burdensome as an objection and yes. so if you have something that you know you have a small soft tissue car wreck case and you're suing an insurance company and you want them to spend you know thousands of man hours getting information about every other claim they've handled across the country right you know even 20 years ago the courts would say no that's not reasonable because right. your little case doesn't need all this right even if it might be relevant so I think right. that the problem is that the uh, some of the defense bar is trying to, you know, trumpet this as being more than it really is and, and really limiting us. It was sold as not being a substantive change. It, it was sold as being corrective of a misinterpretation of the old rule and, uh, and that it would not be argued as a sea change. But we knew it would be, and in, indeed it is argued now as a sea change, that um, the the rules are different and 
we face that argument all the time. But there are ways around it, and we'll get to that. Yeah. Well, first of all, in e-discovery, what are the kinds of stuff that mm -hmm. in a, let's say, a, a trucking case, an insurance bad faith case, or a product case, what are the kinds of, of stuff we're looking for? Sure. So I, just to step back, I, I bifurcate my world into two things that we do. We, we do advocacy where we um, help lawyers get the right kind of evident, evidence in their kind of case. And, and that's old-fashioned lawyer stuff with a subject matter spin um, that people um, intuitively can understand. And the other half of what we do is evidence management where when we are given a volume of evidence produced to us, it is more often the case that the volume itself is um, a weapon and is difficult to overcome. And so what's now required in every lawyer's toolkit is how do you take a large collection of unstructured information and then slowly filter up out of that collection of unfiltered information one, the things you need for a deposition, the things you need to argue a dispositive motion, the things you need for Daubert, the things you need for your expert witness disclosure, and then ultimately the things you need at trial. And that workflow um, is not something that we get taught in law school. That's a skill set. It's a process. But this electron, we're talking about things like Emails, text messages, uh, documents in word processing form, spreadsheets, or was that the kind of stuff we're talking about? Yes. In the world of evidence, we, we bifurcate it additionally in terms of structured evidence and non-structured evidence. So structured evidence comes with some organization to it, and it's a, le a, a little bit easier to handle. So, for example, your question about prior similar incidents, um, uh, what people call them as... OSIs, OSIs. other OSIs. similar incidents, Everybody's yeah. got their own thing. So, for example, back in the day, OSIs could have been burdensome. But nowadays, it is more typical for corporate America to have a document management system. Um, it is a kind of software platform that lawyers uh, see every day. They don't realize they're seeing it, but it's... If you've ever done an electronic filing in a court filing system, either in federal court, it's the ECF system, where you go to upload your pleadings electronically, you know, you get that little pane that says um, what cases, fill in these little boxes, um, and when you filled in all the boxes, upload your document and file it, right? So those little boxes are, that is metadata. Right? That is information about the information. So the document may have content that is unstructured, 20 pages of a legal argument that you have to read to uh, understand, but it's structured in the sense that there's a box that will tell you it's a motion, it's a notice, it's a pleading, it's it's an order. It, it, there are different boxes you can label it as that provides a little bit of structure. So, for example, um, these you know, prior incidents uh, for a large corporation that makes products, they now keep all those documents in a structured document management system. And back in the day, it was probably onerous for them to all produce them, but today, a dirty little secret is that it is enormously easy for them. Enormously easy for them. That's not what they tell the judges. I know it. I know it. But if you if you understand their information structure, you can deconstruct those arguments. Right? And and how do we do that? How do we get the information to put in front of a court? Because I mean, one of the things I struggle with is. <clears throat> Okay, I've sent discovery requests. They hardly right. send me anything. I know other stuff exists. Right. If I file a motion to compel, at that point, it's them saying, we don't have it or it's almost impossible to get, and they have a lawyer and an affidavit from someone the lawyer picked to draft it right. versus me saying, judge, I know it's got to be there. It's got to be there, right. Whereas, So I end up doing a corporate rep 30B6 deposition. Yes. 
and my main goal is to find out who the actual people were who were involved and what the actual documents are and where they kept keep them right. and how they can get them and then file my motion to compel because I feel like I don't have any ammunition but then you know then they try to take prevent me from doing more discovery saying well judge he already had his deposition right. it's you know so what what's another sure. way to prove you know so we have kind of a toolkit that we start with now and 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 let me start with a federal um, framework because every state has its own analogous kind of case law about this and it's it is discovery about information don't let them call it discovery about discovery because it's not it's it's discovery about information so uh, in the in the federal context prior to December um, 2015 if you recall the old language of the rule there was a little parenthetical in the rule that said you know reasonably calculated to lead to discoverable evidence that's gone and and another thing that said basically and you know in the same way that of course an insurance policy is discoverable there was a little parenthetical clause that said including the existence nature custody uh, and and location of um, of discoverable things right so in 2015 they stripped that out and everybody you know got excited about it and and so the way they handled it was they put in a comment about their removing it which is stronger which actually strengthened it because the comment says doing discovery about where information is located is literally and I'm quoting the comment now it's so well entrenched that we don't even have to have it in a rule it's so well entrenched you're gonna get it right so we kind of boomerang that language and basically say it can be a little see we all want to be banny roosters when we start the case right we all want to show them we file our complaint and you know we tell the associate you know I want my standard interrogatories to go right behind it. I want a big, bad request to produce. Get it out there. Really show them that we're banny roosters. Um, and you get out in front of yourself on discovery, and it hurts you. And so, it, so our toolkit on a big, significant case begins with, uh, in, as part of that dialogue with the opposing counsel, um, you tell them we're, we're going to do some discovery about where your sources of information are you now presumably if you didn't know about our lawsuit before and started your preservation conduct then certainly now you've got our complaint and you should have triggered it, it would have triggered your preservation uh activity and now is the rule 26 conference or the state equivalent of it and we're going to talk about the discovery we're going to send to you and to frame intelligent discovery that is proportional to the case, we've got to understand a little bit about you and, and how you're organized and where you keep your information. And so um, it's not discovery about discovery, it's about, it, it's about discovery of your corporate um, structure and the architecture of your information systems. And so that's how we start, is with a laundry list of topics. Can either be written discovery, if that's all you can get. Our preference is to do a 30B6, where we get a designated witness, and we have a laundry list of ways in which we ask them to describe the architecture of their information governance. And that's a new buzzword that um, we should talk about before yeah. I forget. And, uh, I know that you know I'm. I am by no means an e-discovery expert, but I get brought in a lot of times by the lawyers on trucking cases and uh -huh. product liability right. cases. Products they tend to send them pretty early on, but trucking a lot of people they go to a certain point, and by the time I get involved, it's too late to do everything that needs to be done. There are They're documents the that, that weren't right. preserved. There's discovery <clears throat> right. that was done in a certain way that uh, we're not going to be able to retake depositions, right. and people didn't know what to look for, and I. Imagine in e-discovery, if you don't start off, especially in federal court, where you're supposed to talk about this kind of stuff in your old 26F conference, which you do before you do any discovery, you may be at a point where you realize there's all this stuff, 
you realize you're, no, you're over your head, you reach out for help, and then you're told, well, dude, it's too late. You've you're, got you're, yourself agreed to a you're format. You're digging out of a hole. And I had that happen. You know, I do. Uh, I actually wrote a little book on s cell phone forensics. Oh wow! Uh, and a little, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like eighty pager. Yeah. Uh, building towers of evidence, all the stuff right. you get from the cell phone, and also the cell phone records, how you can track yes. more or less where somebody is by the tower location. Yes. Uh, and so, you know, I had a friend. He had read my book, and he knew that he wanted to get a download, but he agreed to certain parameters, and so they didn't. They had like a third party do the download because the cell phone has all sorts of private information that has, you know. Uh. Pictures yes. and texts yes. and Facebook posts, some right. of which may be relevant, some wouldn't. Right. Well, they didn't involve me until after they agreed on the protocol, did yep. the download. So the independent downloader only preserved information Man. for a very limited period of time, uh, like an hour before, an hour and after the wreck. There is a whole host of other stuff that, well, we may not have been entitled to a dump of all of it. We should have been able to have it image preserved right. search they can decide whether right. to object or assert a privilege right. but because the person who started it didn't fully understand what to do right. all that data is lost right. and in fact n if it still exists they have a really good argument judge we negotiated a protocol right. we've done this once right. we're not they doing it again right. and i think that's a so a lot of it is human nature of when we know that we're out of our element and 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 because we don't do two million document productions, we, we psychologically feel out of our element and are more likely to agree to things that are bad for us. Right. And so, yes, it's typical that, you know, everybody concerned about their issue, you know, it sounds like a, a spiel where you go, man, just, I'd rather you call me on the front end or the back end. Our, in, in a case that goes well for us, our activity is on the front end and then we go away. Mm -hmm. And um, and so in federal court in that context, but also in state court, um, in a significant case, it starts with the ESI protocol. Generally, it's what causes our phone to ring the most time. And ESI is electronically stored? Electronically stored information. There you go. Right. So that's where we start and have a discussion about an order or an agreement of how we're going to all behave and what our mutual expectations are. And, and, um, and that is a real important front end platform that's going to impact the rest of your case. And it, and it happens to what we call, you know, there's in the, I guess the mass tort product world, what we call the single event cases where mm -hmm. we're representing one person who got yes. injured or killed mm -hmm. in one event. And then the mass torts where they have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, Obviously, you can put a lot more resources into hundreds yes. or thousands, but even in the single event cases, and you know, when I've not been, and I'm still learning, that's one yes. reason I'm doing right, this, right, right. sophisticated enough to negotiate the right things, you know, I'll send a request for production to Ford Motor Company, right. and I will get a hard drive, not just of you know, millions of pages of documents, but every page is a separate Every page of a document is a separate TIFF file, your image file. So, like, a, right, they have a 50-page file. It's 50 different documents, and you right. can't tell necessarily, and they don't say which ones are responsive to which requests, and then you I have call, to buy. I call that the box of chocolates. Yeah, and then they, they, and then they say, oh, well, they're all made for this particular software system, but they'll give you one set in one case it's concordance, another one in summation, right. and they make you buy all these different things, and, and even then it's still, you don't, they don't give you the search functionality they have within their own system. Because you haven't asked for it, and right. and you don't know how strong your position is to ask for it, and and whether you're or what to ask for to be what to ask honest. for, and whether what you're asking for is reasonable, and more often than not, it is reasonable. But what's amazing is they had to take something in a native format that was going to be easily searchable, and turn it into something almost impossible to search. Picture, they had to make right. they had to spend money to make to it make, hard to they, work with. They spend money to make it less useful for you. Right. Is a way of thinking about it. I, I call it the box of chocolates. You know, when you, you get the Whitman sampler and you open the top and on the, the top of the lid underneath is a little map of this one's got walnuts and you know, this one's got peanut and caramel. And so imagine if somebody just kind of goes out of their way to, to, before they give you that box of chocolate, they rip off that little map and just say, judge, we gave them, you know, here, they got their stuff, right? But there's, but you have to bite into every little one to see what's in it. Right? My experience is more like they're going to take one grain of sand and they're going to paint it red and they're going to bury it somewhere in the beach. <laughs> they're going to yes. say, what's in the beach? They, we gave them the whole beach. What do, what do they complain about? <laughs> I tell you, at the last, um, you hear these stories when the beauty of what 
the circles I run in, it, it's not so much plaintiffs and defendants because I, I learn the most from listening to the conferences where corporate America's lawyers litigate one another and they debate all these things. And, and half the time they are plaintiffs. So it's mostly about who's the requesting party, producing party. And I just remember at the last one, a, a, a person in the back said, you know, um, there were these eight documents and we knew as soon as we produced them, the case was over. We knew it was summary judgment time. And, and we warmed up the client. We said, okay, we're gonna produce them in this batch and you know, stand by for heavy rolls because they, the whole thing is gonna change once we produce these eight documents in this document batch. And, and they hit the send button and uploaded it to the file sharing place and just everybody cringed and waited and they waited a week and then they waited two weeks and then a year later came the case settled and nothing was ever mentioned about these cases <laughs> that they thought were dispositive of most of their affirmative defenses and their whole defense of the case and the other side just didn't have the resources to find it so there are these horror stories out there where there can be the needle in the haystack. So it's a numbers game. Um, it's a numbers game about that. So what's the solution? So the solution is um, we, have to, um, we have to be better students of, of how corporate America manages its information. You know, and I think any lawyer would tell you in, in the days of, of Abraham Lincoln that we all grew up, and it's true, that words are our tools, right? A, a lawyer takes pride in their writing skills and their persuasiveness. And in law school, we get legal reading, we get legal writing and research, first semester typically. So law schools historically understood that in addition to creating a, an analytical mind or helping to develop an analytical mind or an analytical approach to legal problems, we also have to teach lawyers this tool of being able to communicate. It is similar now, although not recognized as a discrete tool kit that we need, we, we can't really talk about evidence anymore without some grounding in the way, in the environment that all of our evidence lives. And, um, and so legacy lawyers of, of our age, we have to catch up with it and learn it and teach it ourselves. Even young lawyers though, I can tell you, are not, it, because there's such a disconnect with the legal community and legal education, it's getting better. Um, Georgetown is a very strong program. University of Florida has a very strong program. Others are coming along. Um, but we just have to get smarter about how corporate America manages its information. And how do we learn? What do we? So there's some great ways. Um, I'll tell you, I, the, I have become a student of how corporate America um, tackles this problem. They think of it as a problem. Um, there are some sources out there, some very practical sources. For example, the Sedona Conference uh, that most lawyers are, you can find it on the website, just Google the Sedona Conference and look up electronic discovery. That is uh, uh, pretty much a bipartisan, it's aspirationally bipartisan at least, um, place where uh, producing and requesting parties sit together and talk about this and it creates, they, they have a whole library that you can explore of basic introductory information. And then the um, Duke University has purchased what we call the EDRM, which is the Electronic Discovery Reference Model. It is, it sounds like a wonkish thing, but um, people that are interested in process uh, have a reference model for a certain process. And the discovery process uh, is now um, conceptualized as, as the electronic discovery reference model. And as you go left to right, it talks about the stages that occur in 
um, electronic discovery, and it provides a common vocabulary for us all to talk about to the point where you go to a trade show and you go, what do you do? And they say, well, I'm a left-sided guy. And what everybody understands is he's saying he's on the left-sided functions of the electronic discovery model. He's on the collections and processing side. And if he's a right-sided guy, he's he's into the analysis and producing side. Okay. So, um, so there are some tools out there, some good tools. Uh, I would maybe start with the Sedona Conference. And okay. And uh, you mentioned the difference between advocacy and evidence management. I said advocacy, I guess, is convincing a court to give you what you sure. need. What's evidence management? Sure. So they're, they're linked together, and we can talk about how they're linked together at the end. But, but um, defendants, large corporate defendants, have been struggling with evidence management for a longer period of time that we have. But now that our receiving volumes are up, we have the same challenge. And that is basically that when, um, you know, it is, it is more and more the occasion now that even in single event cases, you get data dumps of enormous volumes of, of information. And it's so large that it's unmanageable and it's not, it's not even meaningful to you. you. You don't even know what you don't know. And so evidence management generally is um, in the world in which data volumes have grown and they're in different formats, um, being able to leverage technology to um, tame, T-A-M-E, tame the volumes of evidence, and to be able to, to synthesize evidence that's meaningful for a trial lawyer out of a large collection of random, you know, documents and things. And so, that's really what we think of as evidence management is, is taking a, collect, a very large collection of information and then synthesizing it up into useful information that we can actually employ for our clients. I think another area where a lot of us could use help when we stumble into electronic discovery is, you know, there's some cost shifting provisions sometimes in the case law where in certain circumstances, mm -hmm. it's like if you want, you can do this stuff, but you're going to have to pay for some or all of their cost of gathering and producing right. And I find what they'll do is they will really expand the breadth of what I'm asking for so that, the cost, the so that the cost will be more than I can afford to spend in the case, and I back off of it. Gild the uh, lily. So it's, it's, how, did, how does someone like you help with that issue? We deconstruct that baloney, is in a word, yeah. and it takes a little bit of insider baseball to deconstruct the baloney, right? So... So this goes back to the, the thing of we don't day to day have to produce 200 million documents as, as, a, as a producing party. We, we, we typically have to produce um, you know, our client's cell phone or the Facebook page or something like that. But we don't have uh, this big document production um, frame of reference that they do and that they speak authoritatively about when they tell us how much it costs. So um, it is, I can tell you, expect more of it from, th there are two initiatives from, from the Defense Research Institute. One is pushback on proportionality of, of every request to produce. You get an automatic pushback, it's not proportional, so that you, you can anticipate that. The third big initiative is if you're a third party, you have a more um, sympathetic position with the court to where you can threaten the, 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 the plaintiff issuing the subpoena and go, I'm, I'm an innocent bystander and you've winged off this subpoena out of state court in Biloxi and now that's a million dollar hit on me. Yeah. So what are we going to do about that plaintiff? And, and it's a more compelling argument when they come in as the non-wrongdoer innocent bystander. So the way to do it is to kind of deconstruct how they're doing it. And when they cost shift, the beauty of them claiming cost shifting is that you boomerang that back into transparency and you say, fine, if you want me to pay for it, you're going to show me what you're doing, right? So don't ask me to pay for an inefficient model that you come up with to respond to my subpoena. I get to know what I'm getting cost shifted for, and I'm not going to pay for your inefficiency, 
right? So typically we're called in to negotiate with third parties to kind of deconstruct that argument that what we've asked for is difficult and unreasonable. And we say, we'll help you find it. I'll help you find it. What platform are you using? Um, how big is your collection? What are your search terms? And can we narrow them or make them run? We, we can do an assessment on samples to validate the search terms and make sure they're accurate. What other things can we do to use technology or artificial intelligence to, to maybe find a core set of documents that are what we are looking for and we can tell the machine to go find more like it and call it a day. So they're, when they push back on cost shifting, that's, your, that's when that triggers, in, in, it should trigger in our minds um, a, a counter proposal for more transparency. And sometimes when you really make a compelling case for transparency, they pack it up and go away. Now, I noticed your firm's called eDiscovery Co-Counsel. We I'm, stayed up all night thinking of that name, I know. I'm guessing that you come in and co-counsel with lawyers and help them with these issues? All my clients are lawyers, okay. yes. Because I, uh, I will tell you that I find this stuff fascinating, but I'm the rainmaker that goes out and gets cases. Yeah. I'm the main trial lawyer. Right. I am managing my firm. I am doing right. depositions. I'm trying to get better at trial skills. I'm trying right. to speak at seminars. I don't have the time to become an expert at this uh, and read all those Sedona documents, and I'm going to get raked over the coals by someone on the other side who is. So, so how is it you help? Sure. Our model is we, we do it the way plaintiffs do, where we share risk, right? So we share risk with you. That's the plaintiff's way. And um, we do it on some kind of contingency arrangement or a hybrid contingency arrangement, um, which makes sense for plaintiffs. And so we share the risk with you, and, and we have an alignment of interest and mutuality of interest that way. So typically, we're a front-end process. We kind of typically are, are more engaged in the front end of setting everything up, and then everybody's kind of off and running. So um, we do that, and I think it's, it's more of the model that we are moving to as, a, as, a, as an industry, I don't wanna say the industry or profession, is you know I the first time as a young lawyer I, I saw one of these three man law firms in in a big MDL and they're pumping out all these briefs and all this work product and I, at some point I knew them well enough to go you know how does a three man shop create all this work product and they say well this brief we write a check to the professor at the University of Mississippi Law School we don't do that yeah we we rent that professor and then we he goes away or she goes away. And so we're the same way. It's really more, if, if you were as good at doing what we do, there would be something wrong with your business model, right? right? You would be doing something, even if you're a great big firm, there would be something wrong with your business model if you kept capacity like us sitting around all day yeah. because we don't need to be on that case, the whole life cycle of the case. So what are the types of cases where you know you, you could add value on the e-discovery? Sure, so what, what got us started were the large, um, the large uh, MDL cases where our clients are plaintiff steering committees and we can help you know, do that whole slice. And like you mentioned before, there's a lot of scale involved there um, and a lot of work to do and they typically take the attitude of, we want to outs we just want to rent this capacity for a while and then for it to go away but m i've been working for what i call the other 98 percent my whole uh time with this uh endeavor of transitioning into doing this full time because i, I when i say 98 percent, i am not embellishing i it, it's probably 99 90 there's a there's 99 percent of the cases out there could use a little touch of this, right. right? They really could. It brings so much value to your client's case. And, um, and so we've worked really hard at making it um, workable for a single event lawyer just to have us come in, tune them up on their discovery plan, uh, let the defense know that there's, a, that there's somebody guarding the hen house for plaintiff, right? S let the defense know that there's someone as knowledgeable as them standing shoulder to shoulder with the plaintiff and that, that we're gonna get a phone call if they try to put some new thing in the mix that sounds suspicious, they're gonna get 
a knowledgeable, competent pushback. And so we love now working in a growing practice of single event cases. Um, really interesting things where MedMal lawyers are being uh, faced with exotic privilege claims of electronic information related to some uh, patient safety privilege, for example, or whatever. But that it's a growing part that we're trying, lawyers are loath to call another lawyer, man, I gotta tell you. It, it's a hard sell to tell a lawyer that they need another lawyer. Um, well, not for me, because all my, uh, my entire business is other lawyers bringing me on the cases, so I have yes, no you problem. Get it. You get it. It's what I do, and so I have right. no problem admitting, like, I right. don't, I'm not the best at everything, so let me do what I'm the best at, and right. let someone else do what he or she's the best at. It's a at. great model. It's a great model. And I found that I, honestly, I can handle, in the amount of time it would take me to bone up on this issue, it's I can handle another two or three 18 wheeler cases. <laughs> I can make far know, more money than I'd have to pay you. It's just not efficient. <laughs> it's we all do what we're most efficient at, and um, and it's fun. And let's say someone did want to collaborate with you. Uh, sure. How do they get a hold of you? Sure. Um, uh, the the law firm is elect e Discovery Co Counsel PLLC, and our our domain is edcc.legal. So um, between the two of those, they can just email me or call me, um, Chad Roberts at eDiscovery Co-Counsel. Um, I learn a lot from just people calling and talking and they just wanna brainstorm and we do a lot of curbside consults. Um, not every case needs to transition into, you know, we, we spend a lot of time just talking with folks about their problems. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I encourage people to, to not be inhibited about doing that. And I will say that, you know, the uh, the documents you do get, like emails, I mean, yes. you get, people are so much more candid in emails than they are in formal memos that they realize are going to be part of that. Text messages, you, it's right. really where the gold is in a lot of these cases, showing that someone at the company really knew that there was a problem, that something that would really get a, a, a jury mad. And so I think it's really worth it. Anytime you have, you know, a, a corporate, larger corporate defense, you know, one of the bigger trucking companies, uh, especially them, a lot of times they have their own database management systems and you really need someone that knows what they're doing to figure out how you could do searches because they claim that you can't. Uh, of course, any, any product manufacturer, hospital, yes. nursing home chain, I think it's really worth the effort to get this done. Most stuff. corporations now have a, a, a conscientious effort to tell people that they're, even though you, f you want to say that snarky thing in an email, you love to say this, people want to sort of reveal their wit and insight and snarkiness, um, that, that basically not to think of emails as private documents, but in the, look, we do it, everyone does it. And, um, and so the real conversations sort of migrate around, you know, you're always chasing where the real conversation's going on. Uh, it typically now migrates to text messages, so that's more of a bigger component. If you're really, you know, who knew, who knew what, and when did they know it? If yeah. that is a real pivotal thing. So, um, in, but in, in trucking cases, the if you can get them, the text messages between the dispatcher and the truck driver, where like, I'm out really. hours, we'll go right. finish the load, keep right. going, we'll right. we'll make an adjustment on our electronic system. Right. You know. I don't care if it's snowing in the Eisenhower Tunnel; you got to get through the Ex Eisenhower Tunnel. Exactly. Well, great. Uh, okay. Anything else you want to talk about? I, I um, it's hard to stay up with this. I, I ride the circuit that defense lawyers ride. I go to uh, the Georgetown Conference every year is a great resource. The Florida Conference every year is a great resource. And then the corporate world has a whole world called information governance. And so I literally uh, am a member of their information governance group, and I go mostly to learn how corporate America stores and maintains its information and and that is a full-time gig chasing that yeah. and um that's what we do and we can we try to stay timely about it it's hard to keep up with but um but it's a fun it's fun it's interesting it's fresh and new and uh it's not going anywhere it's only getting worse yeah well thanks for joining us and you yeah. know, I'm, i've learned a lot hopefully the, yeah, the listeners this is a have fun too. You know, the whole podcast thing is so fun and useful. And, yeah, I didn't um, even know they existed a year ago, and now I'm, I'm just... Now you are one. I am one. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> Super, Michael. Thanks. Oh, it's thank such you. a pleasure to be here. Good luck with this. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Trial Lawyer Nation. 
I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Chad Roberts. Be sure to tune in to our next episode. I'm really excited. We have Artemis Malakpour coming in. Artemis is partners with David Ball. Uh, she's a f- nationally famous trial consultant. She does tons of jury research and focus groups. And she's going to talk to us not only about uh, the focus group research, but you know case strategies, jury selection, and really importantly, you know we're a really divided nation now in the Trump era. And there's things that lawyers can do that cause division and, and break up that jury. And there's also things that can bring people together uh, and get juries to really work together to get a verdict. And she's going to talk to us how in this political climate we can come up with stories that win cases. I really enjoyed talking to her, and I think you'll learn a lot. So please tune in next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. We look forward to talking with you again soon as we continue to explore powerful insights from our amazing hosts and remarkable guests here on Trial Lawyer Nation. Until then, please be sure to subscribe and review this podcast on iTunes or your favorite listening app so we can continue to reach more listeners. Visit us at www.triallawyernation.com to send us a message, listen to previous podcasts, or learn more about Michael Cowan and our guests. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our hosts, guests, or contributors, and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.